Okay guys, I hope you're having a great day. Today's topic is cell history and cell structures. Please make sure you're filling in your notes organizer as I go through the PowerPoint. So if we're going to talk about cells, we have to talk about what a cell is. So a cell is the basic structural, functional, and biological unit of all living organisms, which means that cells are the smallest unit of life that can be classified as a living thing. A single cell is considered a living thing. So in other words, to simplify it, cells are the basic unit of life, or in other words, the building blocks of life. Um, before we talk about the importance of cell structures, we have to talk about how do we know this. And we know this because of the work of several scientists. Um, but let's start with Robert Hooke in 1665. He viewed a piece of cork, which are dead plant cells, underneath a very simple microscope. And this is about what he saw, because this is a drawing from one of his notebooks. And he basically saw what he thought looked like little jail cells or like the cells that monks lived in at the time. And so he gave them the term celluli, which literally means small rooms. And then in 1683, Anton von Leeuwenhoek was really the first person that viewed living organisms underneath the microscope. He took a sample of pond water and probably saw lots of living things swimming around in there. He probably saw bacteria. He probably saw protists like amoeba and algae and, and things like that, maybe even some simple animals. Okay, in 1838, we have Matthias Schleiden, who was studying plants, and he was putting them underneath a microscope and basically came to the conclusion that no matter what type of plant he looked at, it was made up of these smaller uh, structural units called cells. So he concluded that all plants were made of cells. And then in 1839, Theodore Schwann was doing something similar, but with animals. So he was studying animals, and he concluded that all animals are made up of cells. Now, Schleiden and Schwann were friends, so basically over tea one day, they were discussing their work, and they basically said, hmm, this is interesting, so what can we conclude about all cells? And that led them to develop the cell theory. Now, you're going to have to remember what Schleiden and Schwann did. The easiest way to remember, guys, is Schwann sounds like swan, and swan is an animal. So Schwann studied animals, Schleiden studied plants. So we have the development of the cell theory, which are these three fundamental statements about cells. So statement number one, and pause on this if you need more time to write, but statement number one says all living things are composed of one or more cells. Statement number two says cells are the basic unit or structure of structure of all living things. And then number three, cells arise only from pre-existing cells with cells passing genetic information from one generation to the next. Now you guys are 14, 15 years old and these things seem so simple to you, but it actually was a lot of work by many different scientists that allowed us to draw these conclusions, that allowed us to form these modern day understandings of cells. Okay, so there are two major types of cells. There are prokaryotic cells and there are eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are this primitive cell type that lack a nucleus and other membrane-bound organelles. They do not have a nucleus. Now, you're going to be responsible for knowing which organisms are prokaryotic and which organisms are eukaryotic. It is not complicated, so don't make it complicated. There is only one type of organism that is prokaryotic, and that is bacteria. Bacteria are prokaryotic. Everything else is eukaryotic. So eukaryotic cells are this more advanced cell type that have a nucleus surrounding genetic material and other membrane-bound organelles. So they have all those fancy little structures that you learned about in seventh grade, like the mitochondria and the chloroplast and the Golgi body and, and all that stuff. That's a eukaryotic cell. So which organisms are eukaryotic? Everything other, other than bacteria. So bacteria are prokaryotic, which means protists, fungi, plants, and animals are all eukaryotic. So where did eukaryotic cells come from? The endosymbiotic theory explains the origin of eukaryotic cells. And basically, here's the idea behind the endosymbiotic theory. In the very old age, you know, beginning of Earth, we had just prokaryotic cells, so only things similar to bacteria. We had some big prokaryotic cells, some little prokaryotic cells. And the endosymbiotic theory says that at one point, one of those larger prokaryotic cells engulfed a smaller prokaryotic cells. Basically, it got hungry and was looking for some lunch, and so it, smallered, it swallowed one of the smaller cells. 
Now the weird thing is that we think that those smaller prokaryotic cells started living in a symbiotic relationship with the larger cell and eventually began growing and dividing as one cell. So in other words, here's the summary, smaller prokaryotes prokaryotes were engulfed by larger prokaryotes and they lived in symbiotic relationships and then divided as one. Now there's a lot of evidence that supports this, but the big piece of evidence is going to be that organelles like the mitochondria and the chloroplast have DNA that is completely separate from the DNA that you're going to find in a nucleus. So that sort of supports the idea that at one point they were their own separate living organisms. Okay, a um, couple of terms you should know by now, unicellular and multicellular. An organism consisting of a single cell is unicellular. Uni means one, single cell. So all bacteria are unicellular. All prokaryotes are unicellular. There are some protists that are unicellular and there are some fungi like yeast that are unicellular. An organism consisting of more than one cell is called multicellular. Multi means many. Are multicellular organisms made up of prokaryotic or eukaryotic cells? Remember, all prokaryotes are unicellular, so multicellular organisms have eukaryotic cells. So this is going to be some of your protists, some of your fungi, and all of your plants, and all of your animals. Now, there are cell structures that differ from one organism to another, so that's what we're going to focus on next prokaryotic cell structures versus eukaryotic cell structures or the structures in a bacteria cell versus the structures in a plant cell versus the structures in an animal cell. So next up you should be filling in the chart under number 11 the defining characteristics of these three types of cell. So the three type or the defining characteristics of a bacteria cell are as the outer layer is a cell wall. Now this green layer is a cell membrane. Every cell has a cell membrane. But a bacteria cell has an outer cell wall that provides it with protection and support. Of course, they're prokaryotic, which means they have no nucleus and they have no membrane-bound organelles, and their DNA is free-floating because they don't have a nucleus. So bacteria cell, write this down in big capital letters, prokaryotic. Okay, dividing structures in a plant cell. Again, we have an outer cell wall. That's what gives plants their nice rigid structure. We still have a cell membrane, that's the yellow structure, but the outer structure is a cell wall. They have these green organelles called chloroplast, which is where photosynthesis takes place. And then they have this large central vacuole, which sort of is like this blue bubbly structure. And what do you think that's used to store in a plant? used to store water. Okay, now is a plant cell prokaryotic or eukaryotic? It is going to be eukaryotic. There's the nucleus right there. Write that in big capital letters. Plant cell eukaryotic. And then finally we have unique structures to animal cells. The outer layer of an animal cell is going to be the cell membrane. They do not have a cell wall. They also have these organelles called lysosomes that are responsible for digesting materials within the cell. They release digestive enzymes. They break down the waste so that it can be released from the cell. Now, prokaryotic or eukaryotic, big capital letters, eukaryotic. You are an animal, you are eukaryotic. So I've used this term organelle plenty of times throughout this PowerPoint, but I want to make sure that you understand what an organelle is. So cells display organization. We know that. That's a characteristic of life. An organelle is an organized structure within a cell, a differentiated structure within a cell that performs a specific function. So there are all these little items that are numbered here that all have a specific job to do. Organelle literally means little organs, so they are sort of like little organs within the cell. Every organ in your body has a job, every organelle within a cell has a job. So next up we're going to talk about examples of organelles. So fill in number 13, the chart here. Um, make sure that you include the function and what type of cell they are found in. So first up is the nucleus, which may just be the most important organelle of all because it controls all cellular activities. That's why we call it the brain of the cell, the brain of the cell. This is where you're going to find the genetic information, DNA. So what type of cell has a nucleus? A eukaryotic cell. So of your three choices there, that's going to be animal and plant. So pause on these organelles if you need more time to write. 
Okay, next up we have the cell membrane, which is a semi-permeable double layer that surrounds the cell. This is the bouncer of the cell. The bouncer controls who goes in and out of the club. Only certain people can go in and out, whoever's on the list, right? That's what the cell membrane does. It, it Cell membrane controls what goes in and out of the cell. So only good things are coming in, only bad things and waste are going out of the cell. This is a very important job. Semi-permeable, the fact that it's a semi-permeable double layer simply means that only some things can permeate the layer. Only some things can go in and out of the layer, which is really important. Um, all cells have a cell membrane, bacteria, animal, and plant. Every cell has a cell membrane because every cell has to control what goes in and out. Okay, next up we have the cell wall, which is composed of cellulose and plant cells. Um, and this provides plants and other organisms with protection and structure, protection and structure. Plants have cell walls. Do plants have cell membranes? Yep, remember every cell has a cell membrane. It's just the outer layer of plant cells. So of our cell wall, cell type here, uh, bacteria cells and plant cells both have cell walls. Okay, next up we have the chloroplast. This contains a green pigment called chlorophyll. You've probably heard of that before. And this is where photosynthesis takes place. That's the function of the chloroplast, the site of photosynthesis. Now make sure you write this down here because this is, write this down as well because this is the big picture of photosynthesis here. The purpose of photosynthesis is to take energy from the sun and use it to make food for the plant, which is glucose, sugar. That is the purpose of photosynthesis. You're going to hear me refer to that over and over and over, so make sure you have it written down, star it, whatever you need to do. So where are you going to find chloroplasts? You're going to find them in plant cells. Okay, next up we have the cytoskeleton, which is a network of microtubules that provide support and structure to the cell. So just like your skeleton and your body gives you support and structure, this is like the skeleton of a cell. So this is going to be found in all cells. Next up we have the endoplasmic reticulum, which is the cell highway. So the function of the ER, endoplasmic reticulum, is to carry proteins and other materials from one part of the cell to another, just like a highway does. Now, it, the ER can either be smooth or rough, depending on whether or not it has ribosomes attached to it, those little blue dots. If it has ribosomes attached, then we call it rough ER. If it does not have ribosomes attached to it, we call it a sm the smooth ER. This is the highway of the cell. It carries proteins and other materials. Next up, we have the Golgi apparatus or Golgi body or Golgi complex, whatever you want to call it. They're all the same thing. This is a multi-layered organelle that is found near the nucleus and is used for packaging and transportation of materials out of the cell. Anytime you hear that phrase, package and transport, that is going to be the Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus. That's why we call it the post office or the FedEx of the cell because they package, they get the materials ready to send off. They package and they transport. That's the Golgi body. So you're going to find the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus in all eukaryotic cells. So that's going to be in your list here, animal and plant cells. Okay, next up we have lysosomes. Lysosomes are the garbage trucks of the cell. They contain digestive enzymes, which allows them to break down um, used old worn parts and waste products in the cell. So they use digestive enzymes to break down you know, waste, they break down old cell parts so that they can be either removed from the cell or used again. They are found only in animal cells. That is a structure unique to animal cells. That's the lysosome. The mitochondria, the mighty mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. This is because the mitochondria produces energy through the process of cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is the opposite of photosynthesis, so make sure you write this down. Food, glucose, is broken down to create energy. That is the job of the mitochondria, to produce energy for the cell. Okay, next up we have ribosomes. Ribosomes are these teeny tiny little organelles that have a very important job. They produce proteins, okay, think rib. When you eat a rib, you're getting lots of protein. So ribosomes produce proteins. They're either found free-floating in the cytoplasm or they are attached to the rough ER. 
Next we have the vacuole, which is in plant cells, and those are going to be very large and they're used for storage. Most of the time they are storing water. They are full of water. When a plant's vacuole is full, that is when the plant is very happy looking and full looking, and when the plant's vacuole is empty, that's when it looks very wilted. And then last we have the cytoplasm, which is the gel-like substance in cells that keeps everything in place.